नमस्कार दिस इज फर्स्ट पोस्ट एंड यू वॉचिंग वैंटेज विद मी पलकी शर्मा To begin with Israel's war on Hamas, the attack on a refugee camp in Gaza is backfiring. Europe is mulling sanctions on Israel. Netanyahu calls the strike a mistake, but he's not ending the offensive. In the other war, American weapons are failing. So Ukraine is scouting for supplies from Europe, while France is sending soldiers to help Kiev. Meanwhile, Russia could recognize the Taliban regime. It would be a major political prize for the rulers of Kabul. We'll tell you why Putin is considering this. In the Indian election, the rhetoric over Pakistan is heating up. We'll bring you the highlights. Global debt has reached unsustainable levels. Household debt is increasing and India faces some risks. We'll discuss. In Nigeria, another round of abductions on Tinubu's watch. This time, 150 people taken hostage over two days. Is the US trying to break up Bangladesh? Sheikh Hasina's statements have triggered intense speculation. Will divorce be legal in the Philippines now? Right now, it's not. There's a heat wave in Kashmir. Temperatures in Pakistan and Rajasthan have crossed 50 degrees. How much heat can the human body take? How does heat hurt you? And why China is banning luxury influencers. They've taken down social media accounts of their Kim Kardashian. All this and more coming up. The headlines first. Thousands protest outside Taiwan's parliament over controversial reforms. There were scuffles inside the parliament as well. The legislation could curb the authority of the new president. Critics fear the reforms will be used by China to influence Taiwan's politics. Beijing claims the entire island as its own territory. Egyptian President Abdel Fateh al-Sisi in China on a state visit. Leaders from the United Arab Emirates, Bahrain and Tunisia will also visit Beijing this week. They will attend a conference on cooperation between China and the Arab states. Beijing is trying to position itself as a mediator in the Israel-Hamas conflict. Ukrainian President Zelensky urges his American counterpart to attend the peace summit in Switzerland next month. The U.S. president is yet to confirm his participation. Zelensky says Biden's absence will embolden Vladimir Putin. Russia has not been invited to this summit. Indian Prime Minister Narendra Modi to meditate for two days after the election campaign ends. Prime Minister Modi will visit Kanyakumari from the 30th of May to the 1st of June. He will meditate at the Rock Memorial, the same place where Swami Vivekananda also meditated. Toxic chemicals found in products sold by Shein. South Korea says children's shoes and leather bags contain high amounts of chemicals used to soften plastics. Shein is a Chinese-founded social shop, online shopping giant. And Pope Francis says, pardon me, issuing an apology for using a gay slur last week. The Pope used the offensive language during a closed-door meeting about training gay priests. Tonight, we start with a lesson, a simple one in anal analyzing satellite images. I'll show you a couple of pictures, figure out what they show. All three of these are images from Gaza. Do you see those colored dots? Those are tents, places where Gazan refugees live. Anyone can spot them on these satellite images, but apparently Israel's military could not spot them. All those billions of dollars, all those cutting edge devices, and for what? To mistakenly bomb a refugee camp. At least that's what Israel is saying. We told you about the attack yesterday. Hamas fired rockets at Tel Aviv, so Israel fired back. They bombed a refugee camp in Rafah. More than 45 people were killed in the attack. And the accounts are horrifying. Babies were decapitated, children were burnt alive, and families were destroyed. So Israel has, was forced to dial back. Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu admitted that a mistake was made. He called it a tragedy. In Rafa, we already evacuated about one million non-combatants residents, and despite our outmost effort not to harm non-combatants, something unfortunately went tragically wrong. We are investigating the incident and will reach conclusions because this is our policy. Nobody is buying this, especially after the events of last week. Israel was criticized by a United Nations court. It asked Israel to not attack Rafah. The court said that. 
And what did Israel do? The exact opposite. This defiance has triggered protests around the world in France, in Tunisia, in the United States and in Lebanon. Take a look at this. All this builds pressure on governments and the result is this. The European Union held a key meeting on Monday. They discussed ways to rein in Israel to enforce the United Nations Court's verdict. Reports say most members are in agreement. They want Israel to not invade Rafah. But they are split on how, how to do it. Some members prefer radical options like sanctions on Israeli officials or institutions. Ireland and Spain belong to this camp. Both countries officially recognized Palestinian statehood today. The other camp prefers an ultimatum, sort of like a threat to Netanyahu. Stop the invasion or else face consequences. That's what they want. Now, EU officials will prepare a list of possible measures. Then members will choose one. And it sends a very strong message to Israel. We're talking about Europe here. Jews faced maximum persecution in European countries. Even the Holocaust happened in Europe. So EU nations have traditionally stood by Israel. But the Gaza war is changing their attitude. And these provisional measures of the ICJ, they are binding and of course they have to be followed. We are currently experiencing the opposite. I have the impression that Israel with this choice is spreading hatred, rooting hatred that will involve their children and grandchildren. All decisions of the International Court of Justice are mandatory, mandatory for all parties. And that is, Israel must stop its offensive in Rafa. So European leaders are very clear, enough is enough, Israel must stop this war. But can they force Israel to end the offensive? Do they have the leverage? Let's look at trade between Israel and the EU. It's worth almost $50 billion. Almost 32% of Israel's imports come from the European Union. 25% of their exports go to the EU. Then there are people-to-people -people ties. More than 344,000 Israelis are dual citizens in the EU. 3,44,000. Israelis can also visit most EU nations without a visa. So Brussels does have leverage. But a lot depends on political will. Some EU members are staunchly pro-Israel, like Austria and Hungary. If they want to... They can torpedo any sanctions. But let's hope it doesn't come to that, because this war is dangerously close to spreading. Two fronts are opening up. The first is Egypt to the south, and the second is Lebanon to the north. On Monday, Israeli and Egyptian soldiers clashed near Rafah. Reports say an Israeli team crossed the Gaza border, so an Egyptian soldier fired, fired at them. In this exchange, the Egyptian soldier was killed. It's a very rare military skirmish, but a very consequential one. Egypt and Israel have fought multiple wars. They eventually signed a peace deal in 1979, but recent events have threatened that deal, that peace deal. Some Egyptian officials even talked about cancelling it. In that context, this skirmish is key. Egypt says it will not tolerate such incidents again. That's the story in the south. Then you have Lebanon to the north. On Monday, Israel bombed a city in southern Lebanon. They killed a Hezbollah leader, so Hezbollah hit back. They fired a rocket barrage at northern Israel. The IDF, the Israeli Defense Force, counted 25 rockets. Some of them were shot down. The rest crashed into Israeli buildings. Now, most residents have already been evacuated from this region, so no casualties. But Netanyahu is really pushing his luck. He's trading fire with Hezbollah, he's clashing with Egypt, enraging European allies, defying global courts and bombing refugee camps. If this is a winning strategy, the world will lose. Now let's talk about Ukraine. Bombs are raining on Ukrainian cities again. Russia has intensified its attacks. Guess what Zelensky is up to? The Ukrainian president. He's on the road again. Looking for more weapon supplies. Apparently, the U.S. supplies are not proving to be enough. So Zelensky wants Europe to step up. 
Russia uses over 3,000 guided aerial bombs against people per month. We think it could be 3,500 next month, 3,200 this month. How do you fight it? We are constantly asking the world to help Ukraine with at least additional seven Patriot systems. We need at least two for Kharkiv. In the last two years, European states have given weapons to Kiev, but it's becoming a bottomless pit. And no one has an endless supply for Ukraine. To make matters worse, American weapons are failing. They're not working in the Ukrainian battlefield. The Excaliburs, these are GPS-guided artillery shells developed by two companies, Raytheon and BAE Systems. Its advocates call it the silver bullet because of its pinpoint accuracy. The Ukraine has fired thousands of these shells. One shell costs somewhere around $100,000. So this is not a cheap weapon. Initially, the Excalibur was successful. In January 2023, the bomb had a 55% accuracy rate, so you can say that one in two shells hit the target. It worked on every second attempt. But in a matter of months, there was a shift. The Excalibur's accuracy dropped drastically. In July last year, it fell to 7%. A month later, in August, it was hitting just 6% of all targets. So the weapon became almost useless. 6% accuracy is a very poor rate. How did this happen from 55 to 6%? The Russians found a vulnerability. They figured out a way to make the Excalibur ineffective by deploying electronic warfare. The Russians installed jammers. They, used, they were used to disrupt the GPS signals of the bomb. So the weapon lost its biggest US, USP, that is the guidance system. Now, going by one claim, these shells were just falling out of the sky and the Excalibur was not the only weapon that failed on the battlefield. Russians neutralized other American weapons too, like precision-guided bombs and guided rockets. These two failed because of Russian jammer. Same story. After an initial round of success, these weapons lost their edge. Clearly, the Russians have adapted on the battlefield better and the Ukrainians feel helpless. They've been complaining to the Americans. In a few instances, they got a fix from the manufacturer. But with the Excalibur, it did not work. Washington did not have a solution, so they stopped supplying the bomb altogether. Now, both the US and Ukraine have tried to play down these events, but irrespective of what they say, this is a setback for Kiev. Militarily, they were never a match for Russia, so they relied on American weapons. But Moscow is still beating them. Now, Ukraine is looking for other weapons, better weapons, and it is making progress. Just today, Belgium agreed to give another 30 F-16 jets to Ukraine. This agreement, we focus on what your military needs to defend its population. That means air defense, that means artillery, that means armored vehicles, and, of course, so the F-16s that we have talked about in the past. These F-16 jets will be provided to Ukraine as soon as possible. Our aim is to be able to provide first aircraft before the end of this year, 2024. Zelensky is getting more help from Europe. France is sending some troops to Ukraine. These are military instructors. They will visit Ukrainian training centers and train Ukraine soldiers. Now, we do not have specific, specifics or details at this point. But we can tell you that this plan has left Europe divided. It has sparked, it had sparked a debate in February. That's when French President Emmanuel Macron spoke about sending troops. Both Germany and Britain had opposed the proposal. Now Macron is going ahead anyway with some support from Brussels. Everybody knows what Ukraine needs. Yesterday, the Minister for Foreign Affairs, and I suppose today, Minister Omerov will remind us which are the critical needs for the Ukrainians, so we have to provide them. And uh, we have the resources, <laughs> that's the, the sad thing, that we have the cash, we have the capacity, but we are still pending decisions to implement the recently approved Ukraine uh, the assistance fund. For now, Kiev has to live with just promises. Zelensky wants the West to force Putin to make peace. But without powerful and effective weapons, that would be a long shot. Zelensky has allies, but Putin has very few of those, which is why he's expanding his search. 
Next on his radar could be the Taliban, the terrorists slash rulers of Afghanistan. Most countries do not recognize their regime, but Moscow could be poised to do it. Why do I say this? Because of three different moves. First, by Russia's Foreign Minister Sergei Lavrov, he called Taliban the real power in Kabul. It sounds a lot like recognition. The second move, an invitation. Russia holds an economic forum in St. Petersburg every year. It is scheduled for the 5th of June. This forum is a key event on Russia's calendar. It brings together public officials, politicians and business leaders. Get who's, guess who's invited this year? The Taliban. And finally, the third move, probably the most important one. Putin could soon delist Taliban as a terror group. Multiple ministries have asked Putin to do this. The final call will be taken by him. And this would be huge. Russia outlawed the Taliban back in 2003. They declared it a terrorist group. Such tags often come with multiple restrictions. You cannot get a visa, you cannot travel in, to Russia, and you cannot do business. If Putin delists the Taliban, it could open up many opportunities. More diplomatic engagement, more financial exchanges, and eventually, maybe recognition. Putin says Taliban is Afghanistan's new reality, so relations must be built accordingly. There are problems in Afghanistan. They are evident and known to everybody. The question is, how do we build the relations with the current authorities? That's another question. But we need to build it somehow. Those are the people that control the country, its territory. As for today, they are in power in Afghanistan. We need to proceed from the realities and build the relations accordingly. So the message is clear. Russia will work with the Taliban. But why is Putin doing this? First, let's look at the history. Russia and the Taliban have a complicated past. In the days of the Soviet Union, Moscow invaded Afghanistan. It was a bloody occupation. The Soviets lost around 15,000 soldiers. Afghanistan lost 1 million civilians. So eventually, the Afghans fought back. Multiple guerrilla groups began operating in the country. These groups evolved into the Taliban. So technically, they were enemies, the Taliban and Russia. But all that changed in the last decade. Russia was building an anti-West alliance and the Taliban's ideology matched with that. We saw evidence of that in 2021. When, when the Taliban took over Kabul, most embassies shut down, but the Russian embassy did not. Within two days, the Russian ambassador met the Taliban. He was the first foreign diplomat to do so. So this dynamic is not really sudden. It's been years in the making. Which brings us back to the why. What does Putin stand to gain? Why is he doing this? Broadly, three things, three reasons. The first is resources. Afghanistan is sitting on resources worth $3 trillion. Western companies won't touch it, so it's a great opportunity for Russia. The second reason is connectivity. Take a look at Afghanistan's location. It can connect South Asia to Central Asia. In fact, plans are already in place. The Taliban is building a logistics hub in Western Afghanistan. Their focus is on Russian oil. The third point is security. Russia was attacked by terrorists in March this year. They targeted a theater in Moscow. More than 140 people lost their lives. It was Russia's worst terror attack since 2004. And who was behind it? The Islamic State Khorasan province, ISKP. And where do they operate? In Afghanistan. So Putin is keen to avoid a repeat. He wants the Taliban to crack down on the ISKP. Islamic State Khorasan province. It's the same strategy as the West, using one terror group to tackle another. The question is, will it work? Well, the Taliban is desperate for help. Only one major power has recognized them, and that is China. But even Beijing is not pumping money into Afghanistan yet. So they need Russia's help, both for money and legitimacy. But if Russia does recognize them, it would trigger many questions. For example, will Moscow push for Taliban's participation at the SCO, the Shanghai Cooperation Organization? Afghanistan is not a member, but they do have observer status. Also, how will it change the equation with China? Because Beijing has big plans in Afghanistan. So will they approve of Russia's sudden interest? Will they agree to share the resources? These are all very important questions, but equally important is human rights. The Taliban treats women as second-class citizens. They cannot go to school. 
They cannot get a job and they cannot step out alone. Should Russia really be rewarding such behavior? We're talking about a major power, a permanent member of the United Nations Security Council. So recognition from Russia is a political prize. But knowing Putin, human rights won't be on top of his mind. It would be strategy. Let's turn to India now. The general elections are almost over. Just one more phase remains. After that, it's all about the results. The campaign has been very energetic and vibrant. That too, despite the heat. But one topic has made temperatures rise even more, and that is Pakistan. Prime Minister Modi has himself raised the issue. He has repeatedly accused Pakistan of supporting the opposition parties. But this time, he went a step ahead. Prime Minister Modi said the matter should possibly be investigated. कुछ ही लोग हैं जिनके समर्थन में आवाज वहाँ से क्यों उठती है? अब ये बहुत बड़ी जांच पड़ताल का या गंभीर विषय है. Is there any evidence of this support from the Pakistan government? Not that we know of, but one man has stirred the pot, and that is Fawad Chaudhry. He was a cabinet minister under Imran Khan. Today he is in the opposition. Chaudhry kept praising India's opposition leaders like Rahul Gandhi and then Arvind Kejriwal. That's how this controversy erupted. The BJP picked up Fawad Chaudhry's statement. They said it was proof of Pakistan's support. So what did the opposition do? Arvind Kejriwal tried damage control. He posted a message to Fawad Chaudhry. This is what he said. I'm quoting: "We are fully capable of handling our issues. The situation of Pakistan is very poor now, so you should take care of your country." Kejriwal tried to shut him down, but the question is: Has it worked? Not from the looks of it. The BJP has doubled down on its Pakistan rhetoric. Prime Minister Modi raised the issue again on Sunday. He said prayers are being read in Pakistan for the opposition. Listen to this. पाकिस्तान में सपा कांग्रेस के इंडी गठबंधन के लिए दुआ पड़ी जा रही है सीमा पार से जिहादी उन्हें समर्थन दे रहे हैं यहां सपा कांग्रेस वाले वोट जिहाद की अपील कर रहे हैं The Congress hasn't helped its case. One of their leaders said that Pakistan should be respected. Why? Because they have nuclear weapons. Such statements are campaign fodder. It's like walking into a trap. So naturally, the BJP capitalized. Again, the Prime Minister led the charge. He said he visited Pakistan personally to check out how powerful the nukes are. Now, to give you some context, the Prime Minister was talking about his 2015 visit. He stopped in Lahore on the way back from Kabul. It remains his only trip to Pakistan as Prime Minister. But rhetoric aside, what does this controversy mean? What does it symbolize? A change in India's approach to Pakistan. We are not talking about peers anymore. India is now far ahead of Pakistan. The Indian economy is ten times bigger than Pakistan's economy. It is also a key player in geopolitics. Whether it's G7 or BRICS or the G20, India's voice matters. Plus, New Delhi's orientation has changed. Pakistan is no longer the biggest strategic challenge. That would be China. India's political discourse also reflects that most parties have the same policy on Pakistan no reset until terror stops in simple words Pakistan matters very little in India's elections the prime minister himself said that he said the indian voter is very mature they cannot be swayed by outside actors then what explains the rhetoric Well, look at the global trend. Every democracy is wary of foreign intervention, especially by rivals. Plus, this is politics after all, so rhetoric is part of the business. Prime Minister Modi's suggestion of a probe is welcome. It would certainly set the record straight. Having said that, there is a broader point to be made here: a lack of substantial debate on foreign policy. Yes, there is broad agreement among parties, but there are small differences too, like on China or Palestine. We haven't seen those issues being discussed, nor have we seen informed decisions. It's mostly been campaign rhetoric. For a country as important as India, this needs to change. 
India's foreign policy matters to the world, so it should matter to Indians as well. Our next story is about a number, 315 trillion. This number has great significance for the global economy. 315 trillion is the combined value of all the loans in the world, the total global debt. This is money borrowed by governments, households and businesses. All of it put together is $315 trillion. Needless to say, it's massive. Let's put this number in context for you. What is the size of the global GDP? A little over $109 trillion. What is global GDP? If the global economy was a giant shop, the global GDP would be the value of all the goods and services produced and sold in the shop. It is the total value of every product or service sold in the world. That is the global GDP. As of today, it's worth $109 trillion. And what is the debt? $315 trillion. So the world's total loans are almost three times the global GDP. What does that mean? We owe a lot more than we earn. Now let's tell you who owes how much. Starting with household debt the value of all your home loans and credit card balances, education loans, and the rest. Together, they're worth over $59 trillion. Then we have business debt. That's around $164 trillion. Finally, government debt, which is worth $91.4 trillion. Now, whichever way you look at it, these numbers are too high. This kind of debt is unsustainable. Last month, the chief of the World Economic Forum drew attention to this. In an exclusive conversation with First Post, he said, global debt levels have not been this bad since the Napoleonic Wars. What sort of risk do you think this unsustainable debt uh, poses uh, to the global economy? It, it's a risk also for the banks. Uh, we, we saw in uh, the big financial crisis that uh, solid banks uh, is very important. But we will need in the coming decade to really, really work on how to reduce uh, unsustainable debt. Uh, interest rates has now become the largest budget cost in many developing countries. And uh, this is very worrisome. So there is cause for concern. Let me tell you why. When global debt the global debt pile is large, there's a higher risk of large-scale defaults. And this can be fatal for the economy at every level. Some of you may remember the 2008 financial meltdown. It was triggered by a large number of mortgage defaults. Six million American households lost their homes to foreclosures. Basically, they could not keep up with their loans. So they defaulted. And this led to multiple bank failures. Finally, a great recession. In 2022, we saw another collapse, this time in Sri Lanka. Colombo owed more than $46 billion. 52% of this debt was owed to China. Sri Lanka could not take the burden anymore. It defaulted on its debt. Sri Lanka had to be bailed out by the International Monetary Fund or the IMF. So whether it's a country, a company or an individual, a default is an unpleasant situation although it affects everyone differently. Countries can find ways to secure financing, they can find new lenders, they can also issue bonds to raise money from investors. They can even get bailouts. Even businesses can find ways to get out of debt. In 2008, America bailed out its entire banking sector. The package was worth $700 billion. When a bailout is not an option, companies sell equity to raise cash. They can also be bought out by investors. In the worst case scenario, companies do shut shop if they go bankrupt. But like I said, this is the worst case scenario. But for individuals, the consequences are far more severe. A default or a bankruptcy can uproot households. Families lose their hard-earned savings. Sometimes individuals are pushed to extremes like depression or even suicide. So households are the most vulnerable of the lot. And in the days ahead, their debt troubles may worsen. Experts say there is a $700 billion black hole. A $700 billion black hole in the global economy. They're calling it phantom debt. But these loans are being overlooked. Where do these loans come from? The Buy Now, Pay Later platforms, better known as BNPL, Buy Now, Pay Later.
They give out easy loans to users. Their USP is flexibility. You can repay the loan as per your convenience, but these loans come with a catch. In many cases, these platforms charge a high interest rate. So for individuals, these loans can become a debt trap. But despite the risks, more and more people are turning to these BNPL platforms for loans, especially in India. Look at some numbers. In 2022, the Indian market for BNPL loans was valued at around $3 billion. $3 billion in 2022. By 2026, it could be worth at least $40 billion. This is a massive surge from 3 to 40. It will contribute to the global debt burden too. So it's time for economists and governments to pay attention to this, to find ways to reduce the world's large debt pile. Our next story is from Africa, from the continent's most populated country and the fourth largest African economy, Nigeria. Nigeria has been hit by a mass kidnapping again. This time, more than 150 people were abducted. They were taken from a village in the Niger state. Around 300 bike bone assailants entered the village on Friday. They killed at least six people who tried to stop them. And then they made off with 150 others, 150 people, mostly women and children. These abductions took place over two days, starting on Friday night and going on till Saturday. Here's our report. Another mass kidnapping has taken place in Nigeria. On Friday, a horde of raiders descended upon a village called Kuchi. Some reports say they were terrorists linked to the group Boko Haram. Others say they were bandits, not driven by ideology, just money. Where the reports agree is that there were about 300 raiders on 100 motorbikes. At first, they were held off. Local militias managed to keep them at bay for about three hours. But eventually, the defenders fell, waiting for backup that never arrived. Six people died defending the village. The raiders initially scattered, but then regrouped. Later that night, they returned to the village. The defences had been overrun, so the raiders entered Kuchi village. And throughout the night, they rounded up their victims. This is how Amnesty International described the pillaging. The gunmen went from house to house, subjecting families to inhuman and degrading treatment. Reports say the raiders raped multiple women in the village. A district official described their impunity. He said the gunmen cooked and made tea. They made instant noodles and spaghetti. This is while they were raping and pillaging, while they were rounding up villagers to kidnap. Over the course of several hours, the raiders abducted more than 150 villagers from Kuchi. Kuchi village is located in the central state of Niger, which borders Nigeria's capital, Abuja. The village shouldn't be more than three to four hours away from the capital, but that didn't deter the raiders. And even though the local militia fought bravely, no reinforcements arrived. No one came to help the village as it was being attacked. The raiders had all the time in the world to kidnap their victims. They returned the following night as well. On Saturday, they even had the audacity to take the head of the village. Even an entire day after the first attack, the village received no protection. This isn't the first time Kuchi village was attacked. Amnesty says the raiders have consistently attacked Kuchi since 2021. A local official said that this was the fifth time that the village had been targeted. But despite the regular danger, it seems nothing is being done to fix the problem. Amnesty was direct in its criticism. The group said that the frequent mass abductions and killings are clear evidence of failure of authorities to protect the people. It also said that the Nigerian authorities have left the rural communities of Niger state at the mercy of gunmen who kill and abduct people daily. Reports have also found that in the last year, over 7,000 people have been abducted and more than 4,500 have been killed in Nigeria. That's more than 12 killed and about 20 abducted every single day. Starting from May 29, 2023 the date of Bola Tinubu's inauguration as president. 
He had vowed to put an end to terror and kidnappings. But on the contrary, mass abductions seemed to be on the rise. There was the kidnapping of around 300 school children in March, and now over 150 this weekend. Clearly, Tinubu is failing, as mass abductions almost become the norm in Nigeria. Our next story is from South Asia, from one of India's neighbours, Bangladesh, where Prime Minister Sheikh Hasina has made an astounding claim. She says a plot is afoot to carve up her country, a plot to create a new Christian state from parts of Bangladesh and neighbouring Myanmar. Now, she did not mention who came up with this plot, but she dropped enough hints for the world to figure out. Sheikh Hasina mentioned the plot while discussing elections in her country. Bangladesh went to polls on January 7th this year. The elections took place amid heavy criticism from most of the West, but especially one country, the United States of America. Before the polls, throughout 2023, the US tried to throw its weight around in Bangladesh through their ambassador to Dhaka, Peter Haas. The ambassador was meeting with opposition parties. He was even accused of supporting the Bangladesh Nationalist Party or BNP, the chief rival to Sheikh Hasina's Awami League. Plus, American criticism over the election seemed unending, even after the polls and Sheikh Hasina's sweeping victory. The criticism continued. Now, the Bangladeshi Prime Minister has made a stunning revelation about it. She says that she was given an offer by a quote-unquote foreign country, an offer for a hassle-free re-election, no constant badgering, no condemnation, just smooth sailing. But there was a condition. The unnamed foreign nation wanted something in return. They wanted to build an air base in Bangladesh. Again, Sheikh Hasina did not take any names. She just said that the offer was made by, and I'm quoting again, a white man. Now, observers have added two and two together, and they're pointing fingers at the United States. So what are the clues that implicate Washington? We'll start with the obvious, the criticism. The U.S. went out of its way to tarnish Sheikh Hasina's image. But was it the most unfair election this year? Think about some other polls, like the sham election in nearby Pakistan, where the main opposition leader, Imran Khan, was in jail. Do you remember the U.S. condemning Pakistan, though? Do you remember them saying that the election wasn't free or, or fair? On the contrary, America called it, quote-unquote, competitive. They called the Pakistani election competitive. So they turned a blind eye to Pakistan, but kept going after Bangladesh. Was it because Sheikh Hasina refused to give them a base? That's one reason why people think that she is talking about the U.S. Another reason is the Christian state charge. Sheikh Hasina said that there is a plot to carve up Bangladesh, to create a Christian state like East Timor. And that is the hint. East Timor is a country in Southeast Asia. It's on the eastern side of the island of Timor that it shares with Indonesia. Indonesia had annexed East Timor in 1976. But in the year 2002, East Timor became an independent nation, an independent Christian majority nation, which now houses U.S. military bases, including an airfield. And that is the second hint. Another sign that points to the U.S. So if we accept Sheikh Hasina's claims about the airbase offer, the next question is why? Why would the U.S. want to build an airfield in Bangladesh? The most obvious reason would be to counter China. Beijing has been cozying up to Sheikh Hasina. It helped build a submarine base in Bangladesh. The country is first. China built it. The base is called the BNS Sheikh Hasina. Now a new dry dock is being built there. Eventually, China may try and use the Bangladeshi base for its own ships and submarines, giving it a toehold in Bangladesh. So the US may be eyeing a base of its own to counter this. And the instinct may be correct, but the method was not. Bullying Bangladesh is not the way to go, and it seems Washington is learning it the hard way. They're now looking to reset ties with Dhaka. They've nominated a new ambassador to Bangladesh, which is a good start, but it may not be enough to undo the damage, to repair a relationship they ruined by trying to bully Sheikh Hasina. We'll be tracking this space. If you're in the Philippines, here's one thing that is illegal. Divorce. You can annul your marriage, you can separate from your, from your spouse, you can live in different houses, but you cannot end the marriage. Why is that? Because of the strong influence of the Catholic Church, the Philippines is one of the two countries in the world where divorce is still illegal. 
The other is the Vatican City, the seat of the Catholic Church. But now the island nation of the Philippines wants to change that. It, is all, it has already taken the first step. The House of Representatives in Manila has passed a bill to legalize divorce. Next, it will head to the Senate. But will it pass? Our next report tells you. Stunning beaches, rich biodiversity, natural wonders, diverse cultural heritage, and a delicious cuisine. The Philippines is known for a lot, but here's something that's not legal in the country. It's divorce. Yes, you heard that right. If you live in Philippines, marriages are forever, whether you like it or not. Why is that? It has to do with the country's colonial past. Before the 16th century, Divorce was legal in the Philippines. Then came Spain. They colonized the island nation. The rule lasted for three centuries. During this time, Roman Catholicism was established as the dominant religion. The church's doctrines impact its values. More importantly, it impacted the laws. Even after independence, that continued. Currently, nearly 79% of the population are Roman Catholics. It is among the highest in the world, which means the church still holds a lot of influence. And they call the shots. Take the Philippines Constitution, for example. It recognizes family as the foundation of the nation, which means laws are made for two things. Preservation of marriage and prohibition of divorce. For Catholics, marriage is a sacred commitment, not just to a spouse, but to God. So while couples can separate, divorce or remarriage is forbidden. But that doesn't mean it doesn't happen in other Catholic countries. In the last few decades, the church has relaxed its rules. Divorces are allowed in countries with large Catholic populations, like Spain, Ireland and Argentina. Even in the Philippines, you may not be able to get a divorce, but legal separation is allowed. The couple can live separately, but there's a catch. They can't marry again. There's also the annulment of marriage, but the legal process is slow and very expensive. This means unhappy couples stay married. Women can't even leave violent spouses. I filed a petition for a declaration of nullity of marriage so I could be free, so I could move on from the trauma that I suffered before. I need to be free so I won't be called a moral or a mistress. Manila has long backed banning divorce, but the sentiment has shifted in recent years. Local surveys show half of the population wants to legalize divorce. Even President Marcus Jr. has offered his support. But there's also significant resistance, especially from the church and other groups. They say it will weaken the institution of marriage. That will lead to a breakdown in family values. So, will the Philippines legalize divorce? The House of Representatives has already passed the bill to do so. It will now move to the Senate. If the Senate too passes the bill, it will go to the president. The of course, it isn't a first for the Philippines. Previous such attempts have failed. But the recent passage of the bill reflects a shift in mindset, because many argue that while marriages may or may not be made in heaven, divorces should be allowed on earth. Imagine a city at 50 degrees Celsius. Entire neighborhoods resemble ghost towns. Pavements are empty, parks are quiet, school playgrounds are silent. Nobody with a choice ventures outside. Sounds dystopian? Well, that's what life looks like in some parts of India. West Rajasthan has recorded 50 degrees Celsius. That's halfway to boiling temperatures. It is staggering, but not unusual. Across the state, temperatures are exceeding 46 degrees, much like Delhi, Uttar Pradesh, Haryana, Punjab and Gujarat. 
इस हद तक गर्मी है इससे भी हम माप सकते हैं The way it has become extremely difficult for us to work on the border is enough to know about the scorching heat. As the temperature rises, our primary work with iron rods becomes very challenging as they heat up, making it difficult for us to work. In order to fill our stomach, something must be done. The problem is not limited to states on red alert. Other places which have cooler summers are recording all-time high temperatures. There's a heat wave in Kashmir. In Jammu and Kashmir, temperatures are 7 degrees above normal. In some parts, they hit 34 degrees, breaking a 43-year-old record. So how is everyone coping? Well, some are beating the heat by getting creative. Others are going back to the basics, even if that means trespassing. But if you zoom out a little, you will see that intense heat is not limited to India. It is stifling the entire globe this year. In the southern hemisphere, there's an unusually warm winter. In the northern hemisphere, there is a record-breaking hot summer. Asia and Africa are the worst hit. Myanmar, Laos and Vietnam broke records for hot days. So did South Africa, Gabon, Kenya and South Sudan. The Philippines experienced its hottest night ever. In parts of Pakistan, temperatures are rising above 52 degrees. People are bathing in water tanks, deserting streets and closing shops at midday. The customers are not coming because of extreme heat. I sit idly at the restaurant with these tables and chairs and without any customers. I take baths several times a day which brings me a little relief. Also, there is no power. The heat has made us very uneasy. The heat wave is roasting Cambodia. It has hit the famed... Campot pepper harvest. I feel so sad, but I don't know what to do. It is a natural disaster. I don't know how to keep the plants alive. We prepared, we know about climate change, we stored water. We built roofs to protect our peppers from the hot weather, but it was not enough. In Thailand, corals are turning white. In Vietnam, hundreds of thousands of fish are dying. No matter how you look at it, it can feel like the world is on fire. This is the era of global boiling. So the obvious question is, how much heat can we stand? How hot is too hot for the human body? You see, humans are warm-blooded mammals. So we maintain a constant body temperature, that is 98 degrees Fahrenheit or 37 degrees Celsius. Our bodies are designed to work right at that temperature. If the temperature increases, the system begins to fail, but there is no singular heat threshold. It depends on humidity, wind, direct exposure to sunlight, a person's fitness levels, body size and so on. Most people can bear body temperatures of 104 degrees Fahrenheit, which is 40 degrees Celsius, but only for a short time. After that, things get dicey because our bodies begin to cook in their own heat. And I mean it literally. For instance, let's consider living in 50 degrees Celsius, which is a new reality for many of us. This is more than 10 degrees above bearable body temperatures. It is toxic heat. So the body overheats. It works in overdrive to cool off. The heart kicks up its rate. The blood thickens. 
the water quotient reduces, the body begins to dry out, the organs start shutting down, the muscles lock around the lungs and finally the brain is choked of oxygen. This is a heat stroke. Your body cooks to the point where you have multi-organ failure and this is one of the many scenarios. Heat is a silent killer and a selective one. For some, 50 degree temperatures can cause nausea. For some, the same amount of heat can trigger a heat stroke. And for others, it could even mean death. So why do some people suffer more? The answer is tied to socioeconomic status and resources. Those who work outside or suffer from he health conditions are the most vulnerable. But we all need to protect ourselves because extreme heat is creeping up fast and we cannot change our circumstances as rapidly. So we need to work with what we have. If you have air conditioning, your solution is the simplest. Stay inside as much as possible. It is not ideal, but that's where we're at. If you don't have those resources, hydrate. Drinking water is the best solution. It can ease the load of your organs. But most of all, listen to your body. If your appetite is fading, it's because your body wants to avoid the thermal effect of food. So try eating more fruit. If you're feeling lethargic, take a break. Even moderate physical exertion can greatly increase your body heat. The human body is remarkably strong. It is incredible at dealing with heat. It will work to defend its core temperature, but with extreme heat, you need to help your body help itself. For our last story, let's talk about social media. It comes with a set of rules like don't endorse violence or don't promote dangerous substances or fake news. But Chinese social media has some extra rules like don't show off your wealth. And this has landed two influencers in trouble. One of them is called China's Kim Kardashian. Their accounts have been taken down, their videos have been deleted. Basically, there is no trace of them on social media anymore. Their lavish display of wealth may have impressed their followers, but China's internet watchdog was not pleased. Our next report tells you why. In the dazzling world of social media, influencers reign supreme. They often flaunt their opulent lifestyles, their branded bags, their luxury cars, their supercars. But how much is too much? Ask China and they will tell you that showing off is bad. So Beijing is doing what it does best. It's cracking down. Influencers who flaunt their wealth are public enemy number one. Like Wang Hongquan Ching. He earned the moniker China's Kim Kardashian. Why? Because of his extravagant displays of wealth. Wang was a living embodiment of opulence. He once bragged that he never left home without wearing at least $1.4 million worth of jewellery and clothing. Plus, he's popular. Wang has around 4.4 million followers on platforms like Weibo, Douyin and Shaohongshu. And they all watched as he paraded his riches. But Wang's ostentatious lifestyle didn't sit well with everyone, especially for China's internet watchdog. They decided he needed to take a back seat. And just like that, Wang Hongquan Ching was abruptly taken off Weibo, Du Yin and Xiao Hong Shu. They have banned him from showcasing his lavish lifestyle. And it's not just him. Another influencer, Bayu Jiaji, called Sister Abalone, has also been taken off. Her Du Yin account had 2.3 million followers. Now, censorship isn't new in China. Their social media has always had a lot of rules. You cannot insult the Communist Party. You cannot slam Chinese culture. You cannot promote rumours about Chinese businesses. You cannot promote wasteful eating. You must propagate positive social values. In 2016, authorities decided to clean up the internet. Anyone who didn't follow the rules was out. But in April this year, China's internet watchdog had a new diktat. No absurd displays of wealth. Of course, Beijing came up with its own reason to prevent adversely influencing teens. The state media called it a toxic influence. But, as with all things China, what you see is definitely not what you get. The real reason behind this crackdown is China's economy. It's slumping. Recovery after the pandemic has been slow. The real estate market has burst. Youth unemployment is at a record high and such displays of wealth may sow anger and discontent among the public. So Beijing wants to avoid that scenario. But this is where the two influencers messed up. They didn't take the warning seriously. 
they continued with videos of their opulent mansions, of their luxury apartments, of their custom Rolls Royce. That was the final straw for the authorities. They have removed their videos from all social media. The story serves as a cautionary tale. In the world of social media, the fall from grace is often swift and unceremonious. Fortunes can change in the blink of an eye. But in China, it can also change with a swift directive from the authorities. And now it's time for Vantage Shots images that tell the story. In Brussels, dairy farmers wheel plastic cows through the streets, demanding fair prices. In China, a rare cloud waterfall cascades over mountains in the Hubei province. And the U.S. police have made an unusual arrest. They've captured and put an alligator at the back of a patrol car. Finally, we're taking you back in history. On this day in 1998, Pakistan became a nuclear power. It conducted five simultaneous underground nuclear tests. Islamabad began developing nukes after the 1971 war with India. Their tests came a few weeks after India's Pokhran test. We're leaving you on that note. Thanks for watching. We will see you tomorrow. South Africa's May 29th elections. There was a start of change in the country. We are on the bench of history. I am standing here at the forefront of change where voices echo the call for action. The nation grapples with an unemployment crisis. As South Africans prepare to cast their votes, the question looms, will the winds of change usher in a new era? or will the legacy of the past maintain its grip on the future?